I'm Liz Reddick. I am. Um, I'm a Kanban trainer. I'm an agile coach. I am in, I am in the United States in Ohio. Um, I've been doing, I've been doing and being agile for eight to seven to eight years and, um, loving my Kanban journey here. So that's me. Jim, you want to go? Sure. Uh, Jim Sparks, uh, professional Kanban trainer. I uh, love everything about the Kanban journey. Been, uh, in the agile environment, agile space for uh, six and a half years or so. Um, started as a scrum master, kind of accidentally fell into that role and I've just embraced it. So I love everything about it. It's good times. Let's have some fun today. You think everybody falls into this role? I'm just going to say. Yeah. Vlad, how about you? Hi, everyone. Uh, name's Vlad. Uh, don't try to pronounce my last name. It's not that difficult, but still. Um, I'm from Bucharest, from Romania, um, and I actually heard about Kanban before I heard about Scrum, so. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Very yeah. nice. You know where I stand tonight. Oh, it's, sorry, it, it's just a joke. You know, Eastern European humor. Yeah. <laughs> I am laughing, Vlad, you know, it's funny. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> I get you. <laughs> well, so I think. Oh, Craig, um, was you saying something? Just very confused as to how the double standard exists here with the far left uh, basically decrying the violence that has been going on in Washington D.C. I think um, we're. I think we're watching the news uh, broadcast. Yeah. So. Or so. hearing the new news broadcast. All right, I muted them. Uh, okay. Well, so I think the way today works is you guys bring questions to us and we will do our very best to answer them. Um, Maria, did we have some that were already submitted that we can see as well? Or do we just want the people to just ask? Um, no officially submitted questions as you didn't really have to register. Um, but, um, you can, uh, you know, kickstart with your favorite question that you tend to get most, most often asked and then give people some ideas of what's uh, what's on their mind if you want to start there. Sure. Well, one thing I'll say is I'll just invite everybody to turn your cameras on. We love to see faces if you've got them, like way better to have a fun, uh, have a fun chat today. If you've got them, we'd love that. Um, Jim or Vlad, do you guys have any favorite questions that you get? Um, how do we start? How do we start mm -hmm. um, uh, into Kanban uh, with my team? Mm -hmm. um, or the other one I get is, well, we're using a board. That means we're Kanban, right? Uh, which is not always true. I think uh, for me, there's a lot more involved to being a Kanban team, especially a successful Kanban team, uh, than just having your board up there and moving your stickies or your cards across the board. Uh, you really need to work on, uh, you know, um, make sure you have your workflow defined. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing uh, to getting started uh, in the Kanban world is, is getting your workflow defined, which there's a lot involved in that as well. Um, so it's not as simple as a lot of people would like to think. How much you like? Can I, can I uh, uh, should I, should I ask my own favorite question? Sure. Well, my my favorite question is why, but um, <laughs> my my second favorite question is um, how do we ensure that flow metrics don't get abused? Well, that's a good one. It's a great question. Great I've had question. I've had a, an executive vice president of a company ask me that this week. And I answered it by telling him, well, one, the point of the metrics is not to not to become a target. It's you know the the it, they point to themselves. And inherently, when what we measure, when when we measure some data points, right? 
uh, we measure timestamp when an item is started and when an item is completed. Those are inherently absurdly hard to abuse. And therefore the thereby derived metrics are inherently absurdly hard to uh, counterfeit. Sounds like you're saying if, if you are using actual data, like the real data behind the flow metrics, it's yes. really hard to manipulate those and abuse those yes. because it, it just is what it is versus yes. like say maybe a velocity where that's kind of misused and misinterpreted. So that makes sense. It's the real data. So uh, unfortunately this, this, uh, this person was um, in a context where this, tended to happen and his trust in the data was pretty low. Uh, so this was important to this person to uh, clarify, you know. Um, I mean, we often we often find that with, uh, for instance, uh, velocity or some other of those types of metrics, they usually get manipulated or misrepresented or mispresented. Uh, this isn't usually the case with flow metrics. Sure. I see that. I'd love to take a crack at this one. We have one in the chat here. Um, yep. Four okay. flow metrics uh, where we include work item age uh, compared to others uh, that emphasize only whip, cycle time, throughput. And <laughs> I like this because. Work item age is the only flow metric that is like immediately actionable. If you think about mm -hmm. it, cycle time is a, a is a lagging metric. It's after the fact. Your throughput is also it's an after the fact. It's a, it's a lagging metric. Uh, whereas your work item age, you can bring that into your daily stand up or your daily meeting or whatever it is you have whenever you have those meetings, and you can look on that and you can see. Here's an item that is, you know, now six days old. Our SLE is seven days. We can really visually pinpoint right then and there to, to act on that item. Do we swarm? Um, do we need to break it down? Do we need to see why it's blocked? Do we need to remove a blocker? So it is really only metric, the flow metric that is immediately actionable that you can look at right now and make an impact on. So wow, I think it's important yeah. to emphasize that. I was going to say that just gets right back to the strategy of Kanban, right? Of being able to ask the right questions sooner. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point, right? And so the other ones, like Jim was saying, you can't, you can't ask things. You have to wait. So that's why it's important. Vlad, what did you have to say? Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, compliment was what uh, Jim and uh, you, Liz, were saying. Um Work item age is a uh, an antidote to flow debt. Right, managing work item age is an antidote to flow debt. So I think that's why it's important to us. Uh, flow debt. I may have to explain the concept. Um, it's when you start work and you don't really keep going on it. I have been guilty of this uh, myself on a number of occasions. Um, but I mean, it, it's, it's the way a Kanban system can counteract the effects of flow debt. I love that. I've never heard it called that, but that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. I just came up with it. Nice. Oh, no, I did. <laughs> nice. There we go. There we go, folks. On the you were here when it happened. <laughs> So Jose, do you have anything to add to that? It was your question. Do you want to do you want to add anything or? I just want to add for others to ask question <laughs> because I'm literally a pro Kanban trainer too. So I was just chatting the feed, but please okay. ask all the question to my colleague, <laughs> please. Yeah. Absolutely, you can raise your hand. Uh, use a little icon button there to raise your hand. If you have a question, we'll call on you. Um, you can put it in the chat. That works really, really well because that way we can kind of keep them in order. Uh, or if you want to go old school, just come off mute and yell it out. We'll we'll see where we go with it. Can't promise you'll get a correct answer, but you'll at least get an answer. I've got a question. 
yeah what kind of backlog do you guys have i posted it on uh, social today is it is it the to read uh, books is it the dishes in the sink or is it the inbox which one is the biggest backlog you've got Mm. all of the above <laughs> Those, so all of honest. my all of my work lives in one backlog maria so <laughs> yeah how do we prioritize it okay okay we should just, <laughs> it's just... what about you guys vlad jim what is it uh, is it the well, inbox <laughs> jim you go first um i would say it's it it's probably books and I'm really trying to get the teams because it's, I support uh, scrum teams right now and I'm trying to really get them to layer in Kanban on top of that. And they're really getting tired of me talking about what's the most important work right now. I don't care about the rest of those books and that stack over there. I really don't, but you know, what's the most important work right now to get them thinking like, you know, that just in time prioritization or just in time ordering or however, uh, you want to call it, but so that's that's ours. Bunch of books in a stack. I mean, I have a stack of books I tried to read, and I have a number of books started. I read books in parallel, and I reread books often. So I don't think that kind of qualifies. Um, you know. Yeah. Probably. Uh, probably. Probably the the amount of um, dishes in my sink right now because I've been painting my my kitchen for the past uh, two days and uh, yeah they've been piling up. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Well, we have a couple other questions. I'm super yeah. excited about Alessio's question here. Um, in Scrum, there's a Scrum Master. What about in Kanban? And they said delivery manager. So this is a great question. Does anybody particularly want to tackle it? Okay, Vlad, go for it. Um, so Kanban doesn't have any prescribed accountabilities. In in Scrum, a Scrum Master is an accountability, but Kanban doesn't have any prescribed accountabilities or roles. Um, I also wanted to stress the um, uh, difference between accountability and job title, right? So there is there is a, a difference there. Um, you can fulfill the accountability of a Scrum Master without actually having the same job title. Uh, it uh, I've seen it happen uh, in a lot of companies. I, I see it happen frequently. A product owner might be, even in the case of uh, Scrum.org, you know, uh, the product owner is the CEO, right? Now, what's the job title? Is it product owner or is it CEO? Depends. Just just to give you to give you one example. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question because while well, the Kanban guide does not, they don't define roles, accountabilities. Everybody's just a, a Kanban system member right we we know um, because that... from from the perspective of kanban everybody is uh treated the same right right but i think i think the beauty of that is that doesn't mean you can't have some sort of person there that's helping the team right that's that's the great thing about the kanban guide right that's not defined if you want to have a scrum master in there just helping them make sure they're doing continuous improvement great go for it it's not required but you can some places call it like I've heard some one one place I was at they were like we're gonna call them a continuous improvement guru and that person's gonna help the Kanban team great I that's fine if you want to have a person there to help for sure but it's not required so I think that's that's the beauty of Kanban is at least from our pro Kanban stance here is you put in what you need to help the things that are in the Kanban guide. And if that's a delivery manager and you want to put that person there, great. As long as we're following the Kanban guide and, and, and looking at those flow metrics, it doesn't matter who the people are as long as they're working on the Kanban system. You you can define accountabilities yourselves. Yeah. Um, and that's what explicit policies mm -hmm. are for. 
right? So exactly. in your definition of workflow, in your definition of workflow, you can come up with whatever system seems to work with with your current context. Yeah. Um, and the absence of rules or additional rules doesn't mean that uh, they're not necessary. Sometimes they are. Often they are. Yeah. For sure. Agreed. Couldn't agree more. Did that did that cover that question? Any more follow up questions for that one? Rules or accountabilities? Okay. So the next one in our, our chat from Kevin here is uh, aha moments from your teams who are utilizing Kanban. Anybody? I got one for that. And this is okay. my favorite one. Great. Um, working with the scrum teams and have been, you know, trying to transition without, you know, saying Kanban or Agile, you know, just trying to um, kind of layer that in. And we started, I've been talking about WIP and WIP limits, which is work in progress limits uh, as a way to optimize our their flow of value and weren't really allowed talking about whip limits or, you know, the organization's like, eh, I'm not really keen on that. But one day the team actually I had two people come to me like, you remember all those, like the, the, those limiting whip and the whip limits you were talking about, can we do that? And I was like, yes. Um, so when my teams come to me and say, Hey, can we do this? I, I, I'm like, absolutely. We can. I'll take the hit from the organization. Let's do it. Um, so for me, that was a big aha win right there was when they were finally listening to, you know, everything I've been saying, the messages I've been delivering, and they were ready to embrace it. Yes. That was my biggest one. Glad you have wanted to share. Um, big aha moments don't happen instantly. Uh, I'm really happy for, I'm really happy for Jim. Um, I have a story from a from a company I used to work for, you know, a couple years ago. Um, I still talk to them and I still train all their people, but uh, I don't necessarily work there full time uh, right now. They had a, they had a leadership meeting the other week, and um, the CTO was uh, kind of a bit confused. And he asked his direct reports, you know, engineering directors, uh, country managers, and so on. How come those guys in Bucharest have a 92 fulfillment rate on their promises? And we're at the company level of about 54% this quarter. So we deliver what we promise. How come, how come, where does this come from? You know, so that's a bit, you know, when the CTO comes out on stage and says, uh, ask this question, a lot of people get very uncomfortable. But he just wants to know what yeah. happened. Well, it, though it might take a while to materialize, the strategy works. Um, so uh, maybe I'll jump in. I'll give you a quick story. So I was working with a training team and they were trying to talk about their SLE that they wanted to set on their board. And then they were like, well, we need multiple SLEs. Our work is also very different. This takes way less time or way more time than everything else on the board. And it was a group of people that we had just brought together, um, that had all worked in silos before outside. They were, they were all separate. They did their own thing. I own this thing. So we brought them together. We set up their Kanban board. We didn't really have any data yet. Right. And so they, and we were still talking. So they, you know, they just guessed on their SLA to start with. I said, let's just pick one to start with. And they were like, okay, it's 10 days or less. And it was fantastic. So then, um, they were like, well, maybe these different types of work need, to, they wanted, they kind of wanted to go into classes of service. And I was like, well, let's just, let's just wait and see and, and just pick one for now. And so they picked an SLE. And so they went in and um, eventually we got enough data and I dropped it all into actionable agile for them. And I, I had it so that it could group them in the different types of um, data points or different types of work that they wanted to change and look different. And so then we started going through it 
and they just all they just saw these things are not different oh my gosh everything is moving through the system in the same way and it was just an aha moment to be like the data really does show us exactly how our work is moving in. And, and we don't need to make this so complex, right? All of our work is just working. It's all flowing through the same system. And like, then after that, they were like, we need this data. We need to look at this all the time. And it was just this moment where they, like they had all these preconceived notions about the work that everybody else was doing and why their own work was so special. And really it, it all was working the same way. It was just really cool to have them like have that moment to be like, holy moly, look at this data. It was, it was super fun. So that was a really, really great moment with a team that wasn't too keen on Kanban to begin with or even doing it. And it was great. So fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. So from, from one, one, one more thing I wanted to add because I just remembered. From time to time, I, I get to train, you know, people who already have access to Actionable Agile and they have their data there. And uh, every time, every time this happens, I make it a point to show them how um, utter nonsense their story point estimates are in relation to how long stuff takes. So I, I put up a cycle time scatter plot and I say, let's select only the uh, items that are 13 story points and the items that are three story points. And I color them differently, just to make it really, really clear. And I, every time I see a three story point item that took longer than a 13 story point item. And I say, hmm, how did that happen? How does that happen? What does that mean? <laughs> and they're like, okay, <laughs> we've been wasting our time. Yeah, okay. Agreed. It's always fun when you pull the data out. You can you can answer anything with the data, and it doesn't lie. So that's pretty awesome. All right, let's jump to our next question because we have got a couple in here. Um, so our next one was often Kanban is looked at as a process to improve to improve simpler, complicated systems. How have you shared vision stories, etc., to help see that Kanban is great for complex product devel development as well? Hmm. Trying to think of some shared vision or stories. Uh, we had a team once who was working on, it was in the data uh, management world, uh, working on a project for the U.S. government, actually, out of Wright Pet Air Force Base. And it wasn't, it was, it was a dashboard so they could analyze their data and, and yada, yada. Um, about that. So we were using a Kanban team. <laughs> we started up the Kanban team for that. And that was really my first exposure to Kanban. So at the time, I wasn't a, a trainer and, um, you know, it was, it was rough going, you know, cause it was, I was a scrum master. Um, and so we all had a scrum experience. We all started to go with Kanban cause that's what they said they wanted us to do. So trying to get them to understand that, yes, we can do this for complex development was, it was difficult, you know, be able to show them more of a continuous, delivery and that that you know the arbitrary two or three week time boxes that we had been used to was hard but i think it was the, the the little wins that started to pile up is what really was able to shape that vision for how this could be a good kanban team was um we started getting things to done we started moving through and, and we started tracking cycle time at the time and they could see that it was stable. It wasn't like going up, it wasn't going down. So it was pretty stable. And that was our biggest win involved and uh, helping them understand that even in a complex environment, we could use it. It's not just a ticketing system for you know support teams and whatnot. So that for us, that was good. It was rough going um, at the beginning, but to see those wins pile up was really satisfying. Yeah. I'm really curious about the next question, uh, but yeah. uh, the person the person asking is named iphone <laughs> <laughs> they've gotten smart those iphones I know. Um, <laughs> it's the ai bot no i, I uh, still so, assume it's a it's a person it's not siri yeah. i don't think it's siri <laughs> just, well let's talk about that one then vlad why why are you interested in that question and what what do you so, think uh, 
I, to my earlier point about um, we don't need uh, to define accountabilities in Kanban for it to work. Sprints are not needed in Kanban. Correct. That doesn't mean you cannot have a fixed cadence in Kanban as well, if you define that policy. Right. Um, and by the way, uh, in Scrum, sprint is a Scrum term. And uh, in Scrum, a sprint does not mean a fixed cadence of delivery either. Right. You can release halfway throughout the sprint, you can release at the end of the sprint, you can release at the beginning of the sprint, you can release any time you can or want or need to. You're not gonna wait to deliver a fix for a critical bug that's breaking your production just because it's not the end of the sprint. It wouldn't be practical and Scrum doesn't mandate that either. So um, from my point of view, asking about uh, sprints as a fixed cadence for delivery is um, a bit misleading. Right. So then yeah. in Kanban, right, you get to define how you're going to manage delivery, right? This is another one of those those policies or processes that you're going to define. Like, do we want to have like a normal release date where we're going to release everything? Do we do as as we want, right? That That's another thing where we don't define that in Kanban, right? We just, we determine how that's going to look and that's how we'll deliver. Maybe once, maybe that delivery column is part of, is, is a column on your board, right? And that, that once it gets there, it goes out. But it's not set in stone, I guess. True, and it, it just because it doesn't, they're not needed, doesn't mean you can't have them. If the way you work, you know, you, your teams work better in time boxed iterations. You can do that and still layer in Kanban with that. You can, you know, it, there's nothing saying you can't, it's just not required when you set up a Kanban system. Right. Yeah. And I would say the same, the same idea fits for the retros and planning sort of situation, right? In Kanban, we're not sitting down and having a planning session, right? We're going to determine uh, some sort of policy about what's the next right thing to pull from the list, right? It's just in time decision making on when to pull things in, um, in you know how you're limiting your whip and you know what you're trying to achieve. Maybe we're trying to get a certain product done in a certain amount of time. You're going to use all sorts of data to make those decisions, right? So there, you're not sitting down and having a planning session, and somebody's not sitting there ahead of time saying. In three weeks, we're going to work on this thing like that. That's probably not the best use of your time when we're talking about Kanban and then retrospectives as well. That's a decision that as a team, you're going to make. How are you going to do that? Are you going to set um, every two week retrospective? Great. That's fine. Do you, are you going to say once we have three items on this board over here to talk about, we're going to have a retrospective? That, again, is something that you can put in place. You should be doing continuous improvement though in Kanban to make your system better. I actually find a lot of times those retrospective conversations actually just happen on the fly. And I find those things happening, right? When they're getting together on a on a daily basis or whatever their um, cadence is to sit down and just talk about what's going on on the board and stuff. Those decisions just sort of happen and they just have those conversations organically. And then they go to a retrospective and say, well, the last week we made these changes to our system and here's what it did. It's, it's um, th again, no guardrails. It's something you can put in place, but you, this Kanban system members decide how to do that. Very true. We currently have retros once a month, uh, just as we continually seek ways to improve. So it continually happens uh, while we're working, but we like to have at least that one spots where we know we'll get together and talk about improvement items and i love to bring in my cycle time scatter plot uh, the first time i did that with this these teams it we had the most productive and most awesome uh retrospective we've had in in months and uh, just being able to look at you know the data showing you how we're actually doing it versus how you think you're doing it and identify the gaps between your perception and reality really drives that home uh, and it's a good place to do that in retro i think yeah. Um, also, um, related to any type of uh, discussion about uh, 
cadences or um, events that might be relevant for a Kanban context, I recommend that one, um, there is a an addendum to the Kanban guide, right? Uh, it's available on kanbanguides.org and I'll link it in the in the chat right now, right? So there is an addendum and there are, um, it, it kind of explains or shows a, a range of possibilities that, that you might want to choose from, you know? Um, when when considering what policies to select for your specific context. And of course, Kanban works extremely well with Scrum. And there is also the Kanban guide for Scrum teams um, by scrum.org, which you can read. And there is, um, you know, there are other publications by, uh, by Pro Kanban that will help you figure your way out and navigate if this is your your scenario where you have a fixed cadence or you have these events um, that you also have to uh, adopt as, you know, well, basically policies. Scrum is Kanban with seven explicit policies that set in stone. Well, let's okay. Let's jump to our next question. We're getting a lot of chat stuff, guys. I'm very excited. Yes. Uh, what ways have you had success limiting WIP with a team? Um, I've actually, I've actually increased WIP. You what, Vlad? I've actually had to increase WIP at some point. Oh, very nice. How have you? Would... How have you um, encouraged wow. teams to actually limit? their whip though instead of like because a lot of people will be like okay fine whatever and they don't want to do it or they do uh they do it but then they don't follow the follow the limit they've put in place how have you encouraged them to do so um if you're asking me i wanted to let jim uh, speak first but uh, okay I'll, I'll um ask a simple question how many balls can you juggle at the same time i i can handle two i can handle two i can do zero yeah so i mean one is easy <laughs> I, you just throw it up and down you know yeah two is uh, yeah, okay i can i can handle it I, I i'm articulate enough um three is where it gets really really hard so then i ask them the same question how many, if they're a the, the software engineer, right? I ask them, how many code reviews can you do at the same time? One. So you're only working on one thing. Therefore, there should be, you know, it, it's just to familiarize them with the concept of, you know, you can't do many things at the same time anyway. So why bother starting them? Agreed. I think uh, it, I, I, as far as limiting whips, I, I, I do ask the same similar questions like that. Uh, everyone has multiple monitors in front of them nowadays, but I like to ask the question of how many can you look at at once? And they'll say all of them. I'm like, well, you can't because if you're looking at this one, you're not looking at this one over here. And then you say, well, I can't. Uh, no, you just looked away. So now you're looking at that one and really drive home that point of one thing at a time. But I think to your point of increasing whip, and to um, the next comment in there about uh, whip limits, if you focus on your item age and you're really driving on getting the work done as quickly as possible, the the limits for your team, the whip limits are gonna they're going to come to light. You're going to find them. And sometimes your optimized flow may be increasing your whip limits. Like you were saying, Vlad, maybe you need to increase them to, to optimize your flow. Other times, you know, you hear all about limits is decreasing. Sometimes it will be. But I think getting a in a more mature team, you can get away from the the focus on limits and focus on item age and make optimizing the flow. And the whip limits will kind of take themselves out. Um early on, asking questions, talking to them about how many things can you realistically do in one day. Some tools uh, actually limit boards where you can't move, you know, an item across into in progress, you know, physically until you move something else to done. And 
So, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do that on a, a less mature team where you actually have to force the issue. Yep. So I was going to say along that lines, there's another whip limit a question here that says, assuming your organization works with regulatory and compliance deadlines, how do you find an appropriate whip limit for a team and for the funnel demand? And yes, they are all priority for real and there's more stuff in their backlog. Um, there's constraints about waiting on external teams. Tricky or almost impossible to have a full kidding replenishment ses session as we have a few unknowns. Yeah. There's no, so no. many things I want to like dig into on that one. <laughs> Yeah, that, so that, that might one. run us past our 20 minutes. So we got remaining, yeah. that's for sure. That's a big yeah. one. So it's, it's not a trick question. It's a, it's a real question. I know we've been talking about this for a while. Oh, wow. so, uh, Matthew, by the way, uh, also PKT. Uh, I think I, I I I know Vlad for, for a few years now as well. Uh, I've been I've been slacking up for like past past few years since COVID. I've not been really back into into the into the folds, but I've, I've, I'm thinking about being back into it again now. So well, just have to put well, context around that. Hey, Vlad. Hey. <laughs> hey. Just to put some context around this, uh, we're talking about ideal teams at the moment. We're talking really operational teams, uh, as in whip limits. They kind of um, have to crack on with what they do. They're the sort of ends of delivery sort of teams. Um, but if you think about complex organizations where you've got completely different silo entities that have to work together, Mm -hmm. really is really really tricky and so when you put a policy around a whip limit you 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 rest assured that you would it never it never it never entails that that happens your whip limits are almost at the mercy of the behavior of the organization so i'm saying at the moment um we lack an ideal but we are where we are mm -hmm. and most large organizations especially those that are regulated and have a lot of our compliance as well mm -hmm. um it, it's almost impossible I, I'm, I'm sure there's an answer someone's got an answer somewhere this is why i'm that's why i'm here as well today so i'm gonna have a chat about it um you i'm not really thinking about the operational kanban team the operational kanban team has a lot of interdependencies across and mm -hmm. you call doing sort of replenishment and planning, the sort of mini planning that we have now to see what we should pull. You can't have all the right players in the same room at the same time. And so you you might have teams that if they if they maintain a strict policy around their limits for a stage or for the entire board itself, they might end up not doing anything. So I, I'm not saying we have to whip people up and sort of utilize them up to God knows how many to what percentage yeah. ratio, but I'm saying. If you maintain that policy, then things actually in complex organization would not be done. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, which is my day-to-day -day life, by the way, what do you do with limits? So, just, so immediately, I don't know about you guys, where my mind goes is more about scaling your Kanbans, your Kanban it, as opposed to just whip limits, right? Stretching out that Kanban board, like we're scaling horizontally is what that's not up and down right i'm not thinking about that i'm thinking about scaling horizontally as far as we need to see the whole system because if there's interdependencies there and we're just looking at one operational team i think you need to scale out and your limits may be more of that overall board and maybe at like an epic level or something like that mm -hmm. and then within that then it makes it easier because if you're going to limit your epic level items, the, the big projects, those big regulatory things that are coming through that need to work, that automatically then makes it easier to limit your whip within those um, smaller operational teams, in my opinion. I don't know about you, you got, guys. You've got dependencies are not part of that with other teams. This is the, this is the core problem yeah. now, right? They've right. got two houses different from yours. Okay. I, I would say like you want to see all those teams on one in one space. I Where would have, have one that? big what, what organization. Have you seen that? That's that's a question. <laughs> Where have yeah, you seen it? Would... I've, I've, I've been working, I've been in the agile space for very close to 20 years now, Kanban for almost 10. I really yes. haven't seen it. I really haven't seen that big picture. We talk about the big picture, but everyone has got a different set lens as to what they think the big picture is in a complex right. organization. 
And that becomes a tricky thing. I, I, I can see Vlad nodding. I think you've been there before. But I'm just thinking, yeah. how do we slice this problem and make it slightly better to manage? I'm talking now around whip limits. You know, it's a big thing because we understand the benefits of whip limits. But right. how do we make it valuable to us in, in, in real life scenario at a at a top level organization, not the operational delivery side yep. of things? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I know well, you said that, it's that, hard that, to get all those people yeah, at the for, table. Thanks for your but... answer, by the way. Yeah, I'm just being right. you with you. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, the only I, way I you're gonna you're now. gonna make it better is if you do get all those people having the conversation to have the same viewpoint. If you don't make that happen, if you don't yeah. have that organizational level kanban, then yeah. it's never going to be fixed, right? That's never going to work because if everybody has a different view on what's important, what's going to be pulled next, you don't have policies related to that. You don't talk about how many items we can have in flight at a time organizationally then your teams are always going to struggle. It, I hope this is not going to get published on YouTube, by the way. I might lose my job. Oh, joking. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> this could be say, any organization. I, I will say, I was going to say, I've worked in um, healthcare IT for years, right? And this, my whole career has been healthcare IT. And it's the same thing, right? We have a lot in healthcare. You have a whole heck of a lot of different businesses under one umbrella. If you work for a hospital, you can consider every part of that hospital a different business and everybody has their own ideas about what they want, right? Surgery wants something, radiology wants something, the laboratory wants something, but they're using a lot of the same people to get right. the work done. Right. And so there is never that overall organizational strategy. And so then the lower teams always struggle because there's Correct. always dependencies and there's Correct. always problems with that. Correct. And so Correct. until you get that organizational level Kanban where they start talking about these are all the groups that need to work on this epic level item. It just doesn't yeah. it, it's a struggle forever. Right. We talked about aging earlier. Right. This is a consequence mm -hmm. of aging. Right? There's a reason why aging happens. Definitely, right. And so then the question is, the other question is, are your teams set up appropriately? Right. There's so many things that are here that like, okay, we have handoffs and dependencies that, that our Kanban boards are, are bringing to light. Mm. Why are our things aging inappropriately? Guess what? Our teams aren't set up appropriately. Right. So many, that's why I was like, there's so many things you could dive into with that one question. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Sorry, dropping a grenade. <laughs> and it's Friday for me as well. I should be going out soon. Oh, the last thing I need is having a Kanban problem in my head. <laughs> it's All not right. easy to solve. It's, it's probably the hardest thing. But uh, hey, whip or whip limits in, in your case, Matthew, helped evidence a problem. They're not going to help you solve it. Decision making solves this kind of problem, organizational decision making. Thanks, guys. Just scrolling to see if I see any more questions. Have I missed anybody's question that hit? Oh, look at that doggy. Um, have I missed anybody's questions that yeah, on the list here? They keep moving around as people comment on them, they kind of shut down. Makes it hard to keep track. I love the conversation going on though, for sure. Absolutely. Call it out. Shout, shout it out if we've missed. Oh. Talked about that one. Kevin, I'd love to hear about your fortune tellers don't give refunds talk. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of ways, it's just a, an amalgamation of uh, critiques and Daniel Vacanti's talks and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, it's general along the, the lines of I went to Las Vegas in my 20s and um, there's a lot of fortune teller places there and they don't give yeah. refunds. But Las Vegas always pays out and it's because they're continuously forecasting and giving you new information to make informed bets. So it's kind of just like, hey, we need to give our teams. Oh. I... Uh we lost you okay. a little bit right. it sounds super super I good you guys and have a small question around uh, story point estimates mm -hmm. 
is a user conversation around that and and Ian, I think, I think, wanted to have some highlight. I put an answer in the chat, but maybe you have other ID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your answer. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to, I think I was going to kind of say the same thing you did. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of estimation. I know it does. Um, it sparks conversations, but I, I mm -hmm. like the way that it is phrased in here. If you're looking at your SLE, uh, if, you know, if your SLE is, you know, 85% of six days or less or whatever it is. You know, you, you talk to the team and you say, hey, if, if you feel this can be done in six days or less? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Move on. Uh, if not, then you then you jump into those discussions. If you if you ask that question of six days or less and one person goes, yep, easy peasy. Someone else is like, mm -hmm. I don't think so you've just done the exact same thing as spending time playing poker, getting a two, getting a 13, but right. a little bit quicker and a little more refined process of getting there um, without wasting your time going through the planning poker for 10 other stories or 10 other work items first. So I love the way it's, it's worded there. It's very good. Yeah. And for the love of God, whatever you do, don't use story point estimates and um you know um velocity for capacity planning right yeah and don't use averages of that right if you plan using averages on average your plan will fail one and if uh, steve jobs walks into a bar well steve jobs can't walk into a bar anymore but if he could uh everybody would be a, a billionaire elon musk right there elon musk and uh who else jeff bezos all those people yeah billionaire I... works into a bar everyone is at least a millionaire mm -hmm. yeah exactly on average um I think, you know, the way you kind of turn the tide is just more talking about right sizing uh, for exactly. items, right, in people's backlog instead of even introducing story points or trying to move people away from story story points completely. Um, I think once once people have a grasp on story points, they don't want to let it go. Yeah. Um, so again, data is our BFF. And what we want to do is we want to show them over time, you're probably doing about the same number of items at, like, and so then they can start, you can start shifting them by looking at that over their sprints, for example, you know, they're usually pulling five stories, five to seven stories, every sprint. And it's about the same number of points. Guess what? Why are we wasting our time on having the conversation about story points? when we are already creating things that are about the same size where we're doing that same amount every sprint, right? Like whatever, wherever you're talking about it, I think that's putting something in front of them to show them you're right sizing things. You can work on these types of things. Yes, Matthew. You know what, Liz? I, I found out the most stubborn and difficult people to move on with the behaviors and actually scrum masters. If oh, yeah. engineers, engineers generally don't want to estimate because they understand, right? I found for the last, say, very close to 10 years now that it's, it's like younger scrum masters, inexperienced ones, are the ones that hold, hang on to that whole poker playing, estimates, story points, and all Fibonacci. It kind of it makes them clever, or God knows what. The, and, and they sort of like coach the younger product owners that like we, we're not talking product owners that CEO should be, as we spoke about earlier. The people just straight out of school that call product owners proxy people or whatever they call them, and they've they've they, they've got this mindset. They just love that whole estimate stuff and story pointing, and you can't get them out of it. I'm talking scrum masters right. here. Some of them have yes. even a few years experience, and I, I, I just I've lost the will to live with them. I'm not quite sure how to 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 work work with that, but. What keeps me happy or keeps me um, sort of uh, encouraged for the future is that the engineers themselves equally don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I think the thing about Scrum Masters is when you learn to be a Scrum Master, what are you taught? 
that that you do story points and you look at velocity and you do a burn down chart. That's the only thing that you're taught and that you are taught this is the only way to do it. And so Mike Cohn, until, Mike Cohn he's got he's got answers. You know, to, yeah, to, he does. To, but I would say to, most most trainings that they're going to they're not talking about that, right? And how many young scrum masters are actually going out and reading like more material about like Mike Cohn or doing all of that extra work? A lot of them are just starting out. They're new, they're fresh. They've gone to this class and they think they know it all, right? A mm. lot of people, they're, they're stuck there and they don't get introduced. So to Kanban and they don't get introduced to this idea that story points are bad. And the people that are teaching them about story points are saying there's a whole movement out there about no story points and those people are crazy right that's what they're learning right and so like i think that that is where they hold on to it tightly and then the other thing is organizations have the expectation that we're going to hand them story points as scrum masters and look at velocity and that's what they have to do I, I've been so right now I'm between contracts and I've been interviewing with different places and a lot of them are talking about the expectation of their scrum masters to be giving us velocity and talking about story points and using them the same way and I'm like oh, oh, I don't know if I can do that <laughs> I don't know if I can talk to you so well, and I'm even sure. I was on that train for a long time right like until I did my Kanban journey like I was like how can you get rid of story points how can you even figure that out like because I didn't know. So it's, I think it's more teaching them about right. there's a different way and here's why it works, right? And having somebody like Pratik who sits in front of you and tells you all of the reasons why story points are crazy and realizing, oh yeah, that is crazy. Like uh, it just takes time, I think. You know, what a, what a team, I, I spoke to a friend once, he's a developer. And uh, you know what he told me, of course, I spoke to him a lot, uh, a lot of times, but uh, he told me once, well, now the organization is uh, demanding that we provide them with velocity data. And I said, are you not familiar with the RAND function in Excel? Uh, randomize function. Yeah. Rand you know? yeah. So for every item you finished, you have you have this this table, you know. For every item you finish, equals random pick <laughs> pick one of those values and just assign a value and just sum it up and provide it. What what what's wrong with you? Are you not a are you not a developer? Are you not a programmer? Well, I didn't think we could do that. Why not? Does it impact anything? Does it change anything? No. Okay, so, you know, if a system is being silly, then you can be silly right back. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's so funny, the round function. <laughs> uh, back to my earlier point where when I was... Uh, talking to those teams uh, about their cycle time scatter plots, right? Why did this uh, three story point item take longer than this uh, 13 story point item? You know, you got this one done in four days, the 13.1, and this one took, uh, I don't know, three weeks. Why? How does that happen? Well, uh, flow that. So, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it doesn't control anything uh companies a lot of companies like like you mentioned Liz think that um it affords them a measure of control over when things will be done it doesn't it doesn't yeah false sense of security it is a false sense of the security I've heard a, a lot of places where they're like well I take all the story points and then I do this calculation and then I go and look and I say, okay, this is when we can do these next things. And I'm like, how do you even know that that's real? Like, what? Like, I'm like, why are you even telling people that? Why are you doing that? And why are you spending so much time doing these complex ca complex calculations on values that mean nothing when you can use real data? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to me um, at all. I'm going to title this recording on YouTube, uh, Piketty's Complain About Three Points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Awesome. <laughs>
for 60 minutes. <laughs> They're terrible. I just don't even want to introduce it um, to any ever, ever again to anybody. It's awful. Um, okay, so we only have we only have a do we have a, only have a few minutes left here? Yes. Any last like burning questions that you guys that we can answer in three minutes that we haven't answered? Well, for us, for us here in Europe, it's time to uh, go have dinner. I reckon so. Or maybe... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Well, we really appreciate all the questions. I know it's always stressful when you go into these things and think, is anybody going to talk? So these are great questions. We're so glad you guys asked them. Um, we have another Ask the Kanban Trainer next month. Uh, what day? Do we know what day it is? I don't remember. I'm I supposed to go to it. It is the 18th, which uh, probably the last working week for most people. Yeah. Special Just all your with come, Christmas. come, share your frustrations, and <laughs> we can have another fun yeah. chat about. It. Write down all your common questions between now and then, and come back and ask again. Uh, yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Bring hot Thank cocoa. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. And Christmas cookies. And bring your best Christmas art. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, it should be a Christmas. Theme. Theme. It's ugly. It's ugly sweater time, right? Ugly sweater. Everybody has to wear a Christmas shirt or sweater. I like it. I, there's so many <laughs> no, good I things we Christmas can do. Shirt. Oh, Maria's got hers on. 